Welcome everyone to the 2022 webinar series from the NIMH Office for Disparities Research and Workforce Diversity. I am your moderator, Dawn Morales, Chief for American Indian, Alaska Native and Rural Mental Health. And today's talk is Innovations in Social Determinants of Health, Applying the Structural Competency Framework to Mental Health Care and Mental Health Care Research. Structural competency is an innovative educational framework for training healthcare providers to recognize and respond to disease and its unequal distribution as the outcome of social structures such as laws, institutions, policies, and systems. We have two of the leading scientists working in this area to talk about the research, but they will also consider what a framework for mental health research might look like and what it might accomplish. And without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Michael Harvey, who is Assistant Professor in Public Health at Temple University, but who is about to be affiliated with Brown University, and Dr. Kelly Knight, who is Professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Center for Vulnerable Populations at the University of California at San Diego. Dr. Harvey, please go ahead. Great, well, thank you, um, Dr. Morales for uh, the introduction and thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for um, being here. Uh, as was mentioned, the title of this uh, session is Innovations in Social Determinants of Health, Applying the Structural Competency Framework to Mental Health Care uh, and Mental Health Care Research. Uh, and my name is Michael Harvey. Um, so the learning objectives for this session are fourfold. The first is to introduce the uh, structural competency, uh, introduce structural competency and some key concepts um, uh, that are part of this framework. The second is to build skills for recognizing structural determinants of mental health, stigma, and addiction. The third is to understand uh, application of structural competency to research on mental health, stigma, and addiction. And the fourth is discuss strategies for addressing structural determinants of mental health stigma and addiction. So let's get uh, started. Um, we'll begin by talking about structural competency broadly and some uh, key concepts um, that comprise this, this framework uh, as we define it. Um, and then the second half, uh, when Dr. Knight takes over, it'll be a bit more applied. Uh, so, um, kind of higher level and then um, more kind of examples uh, later on in this in this session. So what is structural competency? Um, the term uh, was first used by Dr. Jonathan Metzl, who's at um, Vanderbilt, um, but the kind of touchstone article was um, written by uh, Dr. Metzl and Dr. Helena Hansen, who is at uh, UCSF. Both are physicians, both are trained uh, psychiatrists, uh, and they wrote in a 2014 social science and medicine article um, uh, calling for a shift in medical education uh, toward attention to forces that influence health outcomes at levels above individual interactions. And they define structural competency, and this is the definition we'll use going forward, as the capacity for health professionals to recognize and respond to health and illness as the downstream effects of broad social political and economic structures. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, Dr. Metzl's and Dr. Hansen's work a little bit later in this uh, presentation. Uh, so this work comes out of the um, Structural Competency Working Group. Um, it was established in uh, 2014 uh, and it focused on taking this idea of structural competency that had been um, kind of proposed by uh, Dr. Hansen and Dr. Metzl and really kind of incorporating it and, and developing, uh, incorporating it into training and practice for healthcare providers. Uh, and so we're a pretty diverse group of health professionals. Um, scholars in uh, medical social sciences, like um, medical anthropologists and, um, and medical sociologists, um, community health activists, people working in administration, uh, and various kind of graduate and professional students um, across many different disciplines, you know, my own public health, uh, social work, um, nursing, and all, all various, uh, various kind of um, uh, 
uh, backgrounds. Um, to date, we've completed about uh, 100, um, or more than 100 structural competency trainings uh, for all kinds of um, health professionals across many different stages of, of training. Um, people who have been working in their fields for a long time, and then people who are still, uh, you know, in, in the early stages of, um, of uh, their work. And I should say that this is an abbreviation of a much longer training. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll have some big concepts that we'll, we'll uh, throw at you, but just know that there are kind of longer trainings out there uh, and much more to dive into uh, if, uh, if this is um, of interest to you. So we like to start out uh, these trainings uh, talking about the social determinants of health. Um, this, come, this figure comes from the 2020 um, uh, Healthy People Report uh, and it kind of represents the social determinants of health in terms of things like neighborhood and uh, built environment, economic stability, education, um, but gets at this idea that the social determinants of health are all about those health relevant social conditions in which we are born into, we, we work in, we, we live our lives in, uh, and, and we you know, have recreation and, and, um, uh, and all of this. So just kind of like the, the conditions of everyday life that are relevant to our uh, health outcomes. And, um, and so we like to begin with that as a kind of foundation for, uh, for building kind of this larger framework for talking about um, structural competency. We also know that there is a social gradient uh, when it comes to uh, these social conditions and health outcomes. We know that there's a close association with um, health despair or health uh, disease burdens, I should say, and socioeconomic status, things like poverty, various measures of um, deprivation. Uh, we see that you know, things like diabetes, prevalence of diabetes maps onto uh, county level um, poverty, um, things like maternal mortality similarly map onto, um, onto you know, poverty rates uh, across the United States. And so this is a, a long um, recognized relationship, uh, this kind of social gradient and health. Uh, and you know, the idea is that the, the unequal distribution of these social determinants of health result in unequal um, uh, or inequitable health, health outcomes. So, um, so that's kind of the, this kind of standard social determinants of health uh, discussion where you have things like poverty, uh, inequality, unequal social conditions that um, result in unequal health outcomes, health disparities. And so what we really like to do in structural competency is to push this analysis a little bit further upstream and say, um, well, let's look at those policies that produce and unequally distribute things like poverty and that can exacerbate uh, inequality. Let's look at those economic systems, uh, institutions and social hierarchies and social forces like things like racism uh, and how all of these things um, play a role in creating poverty, creating these unequal, uh, these social conditions and unequally distributing them uh, across uh, populations. And so these are kind of the structures that we are uh, trying to emphasize within, within these trainings, policies, economic systems, laws, institutions, and um, social, various forms of social hierarchy and, and uh, social forces uh, like racism that can be harmful to health. And so this is kind of you know, structural competency uh, in a nutshell. Um, it's kind of a nice uh, overview of um, kind of the, the purpose of these, of these trainings. Let's see if there's anything else here. No, I think that was it, okay. So we like to use this term, um, the structural determinants of the social determinants of health to emphasize that you know, it's, it's good to recognize the social determinants of health. It's good to recognize that social conditions produce, uh, unequal social conditions produce unequal health outcomes, but we wanna push it further upstream to look at those policies, to interrogate those economic systems and social hierarchies that are, we see ultimately responsible for producing these social determinants of health. So, 
a concept that is very central to uh, this framework is the idea of a social structure. Um, and this is a term that's you know, been used for a long time in the social sciences, but the definition that we use within uh, structural competency uh, is the policies, the economic systems and other institutions like judicial systems and schools uh, that have produced and maintain modern social inequities as well as health disparities often along the lines of social categories such as race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability. Um, so that's kind of our working definition of social structures. Um, in addition to social structure, there's a number of other concepts that we use um, to kind of develop a structural sensibility uh, and also a structural analysis ultimately of society and of health disparities. And so these are some of the concepts that we use within that, that kind of comprise this framework. Um, and I'll go through them now, um, but I also wanna recognize that these are kind of big ideas that you know, we could spend a lot more time on, um, but as a, as a kind of introduction to them, um, we'll go through them uh, in the following uh, slides. So the first concept we have here, again, to kind of sensitize people to the role of structures in producing um, uh, health inequities uh, is structural violence. And while this term wasn't um, first coined by uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, it was certainly um, uh, popular, I think I would arguably popularized by, by him and his work. Uh, I should say, you know, the, the, the late Dr. Paul Farmer, um, whose work has certainly influenced a lot of the, the structural competency work that we've been involved in. Um, in a 2006 article, uh, Dr. Farmer and colleagues write that structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. Uh, the arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world, and they're violent because they cause injury to people. Um, so, um, so we, this is, uh, you know, along with social structure, a kind of um, fundamental concept for, um, for the trainings that, um, that we've developed. Um, kind of the, 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 I think the helpfulness of structural violence takes this idea of violence that we oftentimes conceptualize at the level of, you know, the interpersonal violence uh, and expands it to think about violence, um, the violence that, poverty, that um, policies can enact, uh, the harm that institutions can bring uh, and that broader systems can, can create. A kind of inequitable healthcare system results in some people getting care and other people not getting care and that causes uh, harm to people. Uh, and so to think about violence in that more expanded, uh, expanded sense. Another term that is really, or concept that's really um, central to the structural competency uh, framework is that of structural racism. Uh, this is a term that uh, is not new, but certainly within the last 10 years has been used more um, in, uh, I guess, more mainstream discourse and, and increasingly within uh, health services research as well. Um, this is a quote that I'll read uh, from uh, a book by Kwame Torre or, or Stokely Carmichael and uh, Charles Hamilton from 1967, where they write, um, when white terrorists bomb a black church and kill uh, five black children, that is an act of individual racism, widely deplored by most segments of society. But they go on to write uh, provocatively, um, but when that same city, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, when in that same city, 500 black babies die each year because of lack of power, food, shelter, medical facilities, and thousands more are destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, and intellectually because of the conditions of poverty and discrimination in the black community. That is a function of institutional or structural racism. And so here, um, the authors are not um, downplaying uh, certainly the role of interpersonal violence or inter individual racism, um, here referring to the 1963 um, uh, bombing by the KKK of a church in Birmingham, um, but again, calling for a more expansive um, uh, definition of racism that also takes into account those policies that are creating these inequitable uh, social conditions that are causing 
harm that are causing violence to uh, the black community in Birmingham. There have been more contemporary definitions of structural racism. This one provided by uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor, um, a professor at Princeton who writes uh, that institutional racism or structural racism, terms that are sometimes used interchangeably, uh, can be defined as the policies, programs, and practices of um, public and private institutions that result in greater rates of poverty, dispossession, criminalization, illness, and ultimately mortality of African Americans. Um, more importantly, it is the outcome that matters, not the intentions of the individuals involved. Um, and this last line is one that um, I think is important, that when we're talking about um, social structures, when we're talking about structural violence uh, or structural racism, um, it, it, it might not be that the, the authors of a policy or those who are participating in a system have um, uh, racist intentions, explicitly racist intentions, or that they want to necessarily do harm. And yet the outcome of a system is nonetheless violent and, and harmful and inequitable. And so thinking about kind of the outcome of policy and systems, regardless of any intentions that might went, have gone into them, good or bad, um, I think is, is an important aspect of, of, uh, of this definition that's provided here. One example that we use within the training is uh, looking at um, homeowners uh, loan corporation uh, maps that were used in the 1930s and 40s to grade communities and determine which communities were worthy of uh, getting federally subsidized grants from the federal government. Uh, this map is the one that was created for um, the Oakland and Berkeley area where many of these trainings are, are done. Um, and uh, you know, the outcome of these maps were that uh, neighborhoods that were whiter, that were wealthier, got much higher grades than those neighborhoods that were poorer, that had a larger proportion of people of color, in this case, um, Black people and, and Asian people, uh, and that as a result, federal dollars were funded into these wealthier or whiter communities, uh, and they were denied from other communities um, that prevented people from um, keeping their homes, from purchasing homes in the first place. Uh, and we know that home ownership is a, a huge aspect of we wealth creation and intergenerational wealth transfer. And, um, and um, you know, there's been a lot of research that's looked at uh, how these um, maps um, uh, still are relevant today, that the, that the patterns that they've kind of entrenched in terms of racial and economic segregation uh, are still very much with us and have very uh, significant health, um, uh, health consequences. Okay, just keeping an eye on my warnings. Okay, um, another concept that we use within uh, within the framework is um, structural vulnerability. And I'll spend less time on this, but I'll just define it as the risk an individual experiences as a result of structural violence, including their location in multiple socioeconomic hierarchies. Um, and the thing I wanna emphasize here is that structural vulnerability, that is risk of structural violence is not caused by, nor can it be repaired solely by individual agency or behavior. Uh, and so that, you know, to, to address the risk that people have of, um, being um, harmed by structural violence, we need more collective uh, responses that um, get at the structures themselves and don't just focus on individuals and how they behave and how they act and, and individual level resources, but thinking more broadly about policy change and systems change. Um, another concept that we use, and um, I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly because I'm getting a time, time warning, um, is that of intersectionality, which was developed by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Uh, and intersectionality holds that the classical conceptualizations of oppression within society, all these isms that I think we're you know, more or less familiar with, things like racism, sexism, classism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and forms of um, bigotry based on belief do not act independently of each other. Um, we're not just in a particular class or we're not just a particular gender or not just a, you know, a, a, a disability we may or may not have, um, but that we exist kind of at the intersection of these, of these realities and of these categories and of these social hierarchies. Um, 
And so as, the, as this definition says, instead these forms of oppression interrelate, they create systems of oppression that reflect the intersection of multiple forms of uh, discrimination. Um, and so this, this quote comes from uh, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw um, herself, who I didn't mention um, is, on, is a faculty member at Columbia. She says, it's not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times that framework, that kind of individual, individualizing framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. Um, she goes on to say that intersectionality can be used as a blanket term to mean well, it's complicated. Sometimes it's complicated is an excuse not to do anything and we wanna move beyond that idea. So really it's about a recognition that um, people are not just their socioeconomic status or they're not just their racial background or they're not just their gender. They exist in multiple social categories. They're subject to multiple social hierarchies uh, at risk of various forms of, social, of structural violence at any one time. Um, so in the last minute or two that I have, I just wanna talk about this idea of naturalizing inequality that has been really um, influential in my own thinking uh, and some of my own research. Um, this refers to the sometimes subtle, sometimes explicit ways that structural violence is overlooked. Um, oftentimes this happens through claims of cultural difference, uh, behavioral shortcomings, or abstract racial categories which distract from the structural causes of harm. Um, and we say that these operate through implicit frameworks, uh, which are these kind of taken for granted ways of seeing the world um, that oftentimes um, individualize disease. They make disease seem like it's a kind of cultural phenomenon that they treat disease as kind of biological, abstractly biological, or the outcome of uh, genetic factors rather than forms of social organization. Uh, you know, social structures, for example, policies and systems and institutions. Um, and so some of these are, are kind of vague definitions of culture, which have been critiqued in kind of the critical cu cultural competency literature, um, appeals to individual behavior for explaining why some people are sick and other people are healthy, uh, appeals to biological differences or, or genetic differences. Um, I think that's all I have here. So I'll just, um, last slide, I have uh, uh, just some research that I've done looking at public health um, education and looking at kind of the theories that are taught within master's level um, public health courses and uh, finding that there's a real focus on health behavior theories, kind of explanations of health that rely on um, kind of concepts related to behavior and, and appeals to behavior and very little in the way of social theory. Uh, and you know, what this, you know, what we kind of su suggest this does is that trains people who are very kind of behaviorally oriented, who are asking questions that are behaviorally oriented, who are choosing methods that are very behaviorally oriented and, um, and interpreting their findings in a way that, that really emphasize behavior and who don't have this kind of sensitivity to structure that we're trying to develop within uh, these structural competency trainings. And I've called in various places for kind of the incorporation of more social theory within uh, specifically public health uh, instruction. So um, uh, with that, I will turn things over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly Knight, um, who will um, take some of these abstract ideas that uh, kind of have been discussing and, um, and uh, kind of apply it to, to some of her own work. Great. Thanks so much, Michael, uh, for uh, for getting us all started. I'm really happy to be here today, and um, and I'm going to sort of transition us from the conceptual work that Michael did around structural competency and some of the history of where the framework came from to talk a little bit more specifically about the ways that it can show up both in clinical spaces and training and also in research. Um, so I want to start by, um, by looking at a couple of studies that I've led, um, looking at chronic non-cancer pain and substance use in primary care safety net settings. So I've had a, a series of, of um, R01s uh, examining this, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodologies that we use to really be able to think about um, how can we make structure visible and the impacts of structural on health, structures on health disparities visible in, um, in our NIH research. 
Um, and I just want to acknowledge my teams because um, it takes a lot more than just me um, to get this work done. Um, and I've worked with a with an incredible team of folks who who do data collection and analysis with me over time. Um, uh, on both of these R01 studies. But I want to start with an example because sometimes when we talk about what's the relationship between the, the social determinants of health and the structural determinants of health, um, the structures are still hard to identify. And so I want to take an example uh, from uh, the primary care safety net uh, clinical settings where, where I've been doing this research of a specific patient trajectory to sort of see how we use um, multiple methods. And these in, in my work, I'm, a tra I'm trained as a medical anthropologist, so I do primarily qualitative led work um, and then do mixed methods uh, research. And I'll talk in another example of a, of a body of research where we've used quantitative and qualitative um, work together to really capture um, where, where structures are, are, uh, are producing um, health um, in those settings. But in this study, we do qualitative interviews with providers. We do qualitative interviews with patients with chronic non-cancer pain and opioid use disorder. And then we do clinic observations where we observe the interactions in clinical, in clinical uh, space uh, to see how uh, you know, opioid use management and, and pain management, opioid prescribing is being managed. And then we look at, um, we go to home visits with patients to see and examine issues around function, functionality and community level factors are impacting their care and health. And then we also do interviews with a set of key informants, which include people who are um, responsible for pre-authorization payments and insurance payments to cover treatments for pain that might be alternatives to opioids, um, to DEA officials who are responsible for monitoring opioid prescribing, um, you know, at a state and, and federal level, to local harm reduction providers who are helping people who might have left primary care safety net as a result of, um, of changing prescribing policies and really include all of that in the analysis to be able to identify the structures. But let's take a particular case. So this is a particular person. Um, this is an aggregate, of course, for confidentiality reasons, but this is a particular person who had poorly managed chronic non-cancer pain and left primary care um, after having a positive urine toxicology screening for cocaine and a subsequent opioid taper. So this is kind of, in, you know, in many ways, this is sort of all you can get, um, or, or one way if you're just focusing on what the patient's experience is um, in a standard medical history. And, and I want to take us a little bit farther out from there and start with the, with the, with the medical history that I just shared, what, what a provider who's in a clinical space may just know about this patient. Or if, if we're doing a research study that just focuses on um, clinic access and utilization, this may be all we learn. But what's the social determinants of health? What are the social histories? So in this particular case of this patient, um, he was arrested. Um, and incarcerated after being severely beaten by the police as, as a young teenager. Um, he developed a drug and alcohol use um, disorder as a result of some of those traumatic interactions and also became gang affiliated um, to protect himself. He, was, he grew up in an area of California where there was widespread um, uh, um, police violence of this nature um, as he was growing up and he became reincarcerated. Um, he experienced multiple leg uh, fractures to his leg and back during a prison work project um, and was prescribed opioids as a result. The opioid doses were escalated by his primary care provider. He was in a physical conflict with his spouse and evicted from his home. Uh, he uh, engaged in construction work for a friend in exchange for housing when he became uh, housing vulnerable or at risk for homelessness. And he was re-injured during that construction work and began to use cocaine as an, uh, as an analgesic to be able to manage that, um, that, uh, that uh, the escalated pain, had a positive UTOX screen, experienced a taper and left care. So those are the so that's the social context, the broad sort of circumstances that we need to understand to see how sort of a patient ended up in this, in this place or in this setting, right? But what are the structural determinants? One of them is racial profiling and institutionalized police violence, which as I mentioned, has been documented and, and, and legislated uh, or uh, gone through the legal system in terms of adjudication for the policing systems in the neighborhood in California where this person grew up. We have mandatory minimum sentencing policies for nonviolent drug offenses, which, which um, made, meant that 
um, uh, being involved in uh, the drug economy and having a substance use disorder increase the likelihood of extended periods of time being incarcerated in prison for this individual. Uh, work swaps uh, is, a, is a systemic form of, of prison labor um, that uses untrained inmates to fight fires in California, for example, which is really common, um, which led to this person's injury. We're now widely aware of the pharmaceutical company push for opioid prescribing that influenced the primary care provider at a structural level to escalate opioid doses. Um, the medical literature supported this. So we had the medical, sort of the scientists, the NIH and other funded um, researchers like myself really supported um, opioids for chronic non-cancer pain, which contributed structurally to the experience of this, um, this patient. Unregulated low wage uh, labor markets um, contributed to the kind of work that this person could engage in when, when they were housing vulnerable. Um, lack of effective funding uh, uh, funding for effective treatment for cocaine use disorder or stimulant use disorder um, is, a, is a structural issue that many people, particularly polysubstance using opioid and stimulant users face when they're trying to manage their stimulant use um, and come up with alternatives. The change in guidelines for opioid prescribing at the clinical level, um, it, particularly the CDC guidelines of 2016, um, meant that this person um, experienced a rapid opioid taper um, as a result of a positive cocaine. And we see in the recent JAMA article that was just released, the mental health and overdose risks that that produced for many patients, including the risk of patients leaving care, which is precisely what happened as a result of, um, or partially contributed by the limited funding options for alternative treatments in the safety net setting. So this is the, the red is the structure, and this is what we're trying to attend to when we're doing research to understand um, where, what are the structural determinants of health or structurally competent research. Um, we see here in this diagram, just a, another way of understanding this is the structural factors and inequities contributing to structural violence, which produces um, harm, is harmful to mental health. We get the naturalizing inequalities component happening where it's really, the patient is really blamed or it's a, a highly individualized um, discussion around poor choices. Um, rather than an understanding of the sort of the conditions of possibility that made uh, that made that constructed those choices for the patient and for the provider in terms of their prescribing behaviors and access to alternative treatments, and this contributes to uh, to trauma and social suffering, and you kind of get into a cycle here. Unless you can, what we argue in structural competency is research and and try and inform the policies and structures that are informing this. How do yeah? How do we address the cycle? Um, and, and I'm going to talk about that through research. I just want to briefly touch on something that, uh, that, that Michael raised earlier is that this really came from, from the Helena Hans and Jonathan Metzl wrote The Protest Psychosis, which was a book that really identified the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia among Black men during the civil rights movement as a way to medically manage uh, uh, appropriate social protests to, to ongoing structural and interpersonal racism that so many were experiencing at that time. And this is where he first coined structural competency to really identify the ways in which mental health and psychiatry specifically has a long history of associating behaviors with, with uh, racialized uh, or gendered um, or ableist stereotypes. And this is a, an old Howadol ad that was in uh, Archives of General Psychiatry um, in 1974, and then associating medical uh, solutions or medicalization solutions for, for social problems. Or as Helena Hansen points us toward, um, clinical training must focus its gaze from the exclusive focus on individual encounter to include organizations, institutions, and policies, neighborhoods, and cities can address that. And so I'm going to share with you an, uh, a second example from a research that I've done where we really try and sort of drill down on what that would actually mean to, to try and reorganize a, a structurally competent response to complex social problems. And one of the ways, and I'll just say both uh, Helena Hansen, who's at UCLA, um, not UCSF, I should say, and I'm at UCSF, not UC San Diego, but all the UCs sometimes get all scrambled up. I know we're many, we're many medical schools, um, but um, is to understand that um, both Jonathan and Helena Hansen, Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen are psychiatrists and um, a historian 
Uh, I'm Jonathan Metzl's partner, medical anthropologist. So they're both physician scholars who are really deeply aware of mental health and particularly the intersection of stigma, mental health and addiction as a, as a point of critical uh, intervention uh, for structural, structurally competent clinical care and research. Um, and one of the frameworks that, that, that we want to think about when we think about this is to think about stigma as a way in which stigma operates on the individual level. Um, and so I just, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but I wanted to share this article with you because I think it's really does a great job of sort of parsing out the levels of stigma from, and from anticipated stigma that structurally marginalized people may experience that uh, in healthcare settings, for example, that makes them um, mistrustful or reluctant to engage in healthcare because they anticipate that they will be stigmatized based on their various social positions and behaviors um, to enacted stigma, which is where providers or researchers or others are, are, are enacting stigma in the ways that they're interacting with, with, um, with patients or, re or research participants. Um, two levels of public stigma, which is so critical when we think about mental health and addiction and their intersection is the ways that stereotypes, for example, about people with opioid use disorder, such as perceived dangerousness or perceived moral failings, really translate into the ways in which they infiltrate and translate into the ways in which we conduct research and care for communities of people that share those, those symptoms or diagnoses. Um, and all the way up to structural stigma, which is of course critical for structural competency work and the ways that we can understand what are the, what are the systems, institutions, policies that are, that are codifying or normalizing these forms of stigma that are allowing them to, to perpetuate um, and be unaddressed. And research has a really important uh, role to play in this. And so I wanna go into the second example I have before we get to questions to really drill down a little bit, as I said, into some of the studies that I've done on mental health, drug use and socio-structural marginalization. And some of those have been NIH studies or studies funded by uh, foundations and state agencies to really try and understand the complex relationship um, between mental health, drug use, and socio-structural marginalization, particularly in the context of housing vulnerability, which is my area of, of research. And again, getting back to the methodological question, it really becomes uh, an issue of understanding that this, this to have a structurally competent research portfolio or approach doesn't mean that you're sort of setting everything and nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a set of, of well-organized research questions and methodologies that then you can apply often in a mixed methods context. I advocate for that. I think that's most successful to be able to make structures visible, which sometimes really requires a quantitative or a big, big data analysis approach to really see how systems are affecting wide swaths of a population. And then also do the qualitative work and the ethnographic work to really understand how people are having differential experiences based on their interactions with institutions and systems. Um, and so I'm just gonna share one piece of work. This is from um, our NIDA work that was that looked at violence and victimization among um, a, a population of HIV uh, positive and HIV negative um, women identified people. And we looked at it in both of those ways. So on, on the one side, I don't know if it'll be your left or your right, um, we have the paper we published in the American Journal of Public Health that was quantitative, that looked at the, the relationship between violent experiences that, um, that participants experienced in their housing settings and are well unsheltered and levels of psychiatric comorbidity to really demonstrate that there were some, there were some strategies that, that, um, that the participants in our study were using to um, isolate themselves from forms of violence um, that they were experiencing. And on the other side, here's our paper that was primarily uh, qualitative and ethnographic, where we demonstrated the role of the built environment, the types of housing that was available to our research participants, and the way that that housing was funded, um, uh, and the policies around that, uh, the specific policies around the ways that that housing was available and organized, really contributed to the, the um, both risk for victimization um, amongst the people in our study and also the ways in which they can manage their psychiatric comorbidities uh, or their psychiatric symptoms um, and, and the ways in which they felt that they could manage or have control over their substance use, which we know 
those are those are highly those are highly correlated um, in terms of being in a trauma informed calm space um, for people who are experiencing a lot of housing vulnerability. So, so that's um, so that's uh, one example of ways you can sort of use mixed methods to be able to really identify the structures. The second example I'm going to draw on was also related to the work that was happening at this time, but is related um, directly and comes directly from a book that I did, which was a four-year ethnography of pregnant people who were um, unstably housed um, and, uh, and living in uh, single room occupancy hotels that were, again, organized by various types of funding streams. So some were government uh, funded and organized and some were privately organized and had really different outcomes in terms of being able to protect people um, and have better pregnancy outcomes. And so we took a case from that study and I collaborated with um, Andrea Jackson here at the top, Ashish Prem Kumar and Laura Duncan, who were all um, OBGYN um, uh, uh, faculty and attendings at UCSF at the time to, to create a case for the New England Journal that was really focused on how do we transform medical education and research to, to, uh, to, to change the way in which um, uh, the trajectories happen for the people uh, that are experiencing this intersecting or intersection, intersecting forms of oppression. So this was a case, and I'll just read it here, that this is the case note. So similar to the opioid case that I just shared with you, where you get sort of this is what the, the clinician would write, or this is maybe sometimes the limits of the research that gets collected. And then I'm going to share a second quote from the nursing staff that this individual overheard while they were being hospitalized. So this is the, 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 the note, 39-year-old African-American woman, opioid user, possibly homeless, preterm birth at approximately 24 weeks of pregnancy, most likely due to cervical insufficiency resulting in a neonatal demise. It's a very clinical um, uh, summation of, a, of, a, of an experience, of a healthcare interaction experience that happened with uh, the person we call Ms. W in this case. This is what she overheard when she was in the hospital, when two nursing staff outside the door were discussing her case. And one said to the other, this sadly is a typical case. These women are in such a bad way. It feels like there's very little we can do. They should be given an IUD along with their methadone. It's terrible to say, but it might be a blessing that the baby didn't survive. It probably would have just ended up in foster care anyway after going through opioid withdrawal. So that's a really heavy statement to sit with and has multiple, multiple forms of, of enacted stigma and structural violence involved in it. It led to Ms. W leaving AMA, which is against medical advice. She also lost access to her methadone maintenance treatment because it was linked to her pregnancy. And so when she was no longer pregnant as a result of her baby dying at 24 weeks, she lost access to her treatment. In a subsequent pregnancy, she avoided prenatal care and she had a second obstetric emergency and ended up with a second um, stillbirth. Um, so terrible, terrible uh, um, health disparities that we know are reflective both of infant more, black infant mortality and not in her case, but also contribute to black maternal mortality, which are at dis incredibly disproportionate rates um, in this country. And so this is a case where we can really examine both the forms of stigma that Ms. W experiences. I already mentioned enacted stigma. She experienced anticipatory stigma in the sense that she avoided prenatal care for her subsequent pregnancies because of her, her, her treatment and the assumptions that were made about uh, her treatment. And in terms of structural factors beyond the forms of intersecting forms of structural oppression that she experienced during her clinical um, during her clinical interaction, which were, which were so significant, including the outright um, uh, uh, non-acknowledgement of her loss or of her parenting goals, um, which happens over and over again, um, particularly among um, Black parenting people in the United States. Um, she also lost access to her drug treatment to her methadone, um, which was linked through a funding stream, again, a structural or policy decision. So what can we do? I'll wrap up in my last minute here to just talk about some of the strategies that we have in place because there's multiple forms of intervention that can change the outcome. And what we talk about in structural competency is them on levels because there's the interpersonal level, which is the sort of 
the shorthand for that is the work we need to do on ourselves, what we need to do, how we need to educate ourselves and be aware of the ways in which we might be causing harm in our research, what we need to be more aware of and who we need to be collaborating with to do more structurally competent work. Interpersonal has to do with that communication piece. The clinic level is about what can we change about the way cl clinical care or healthcare is organized to be more structurally competent and, and to match better to, uh, to the needs um, of, of structurally vulnerable people. Um, community is where are our partnerships? Who are doing this aligned work along these intersectional forms of marginality and oppression that we can collaborate with? Research, um, I've been talking about already, and that's really my wheelhouse as a, as a researcher. And then policy, of course, um, is, you know, how can we be directly speaking to policy? So in Ms. W's case, at the interpersonal level, we have person first and clinically appropriate language. And this is where we work at UCSF through the repair project and also through other medical education efforts to ensure that we're using appropriate language in clinical settings um, and recognizing internalized biases and where they come from and really focusing on medical education. At the interpersonal level, it's really having language. And in the research setting, I think it has to do with, um, with thinking about the ways in which we're asking research questions. And are our research questions that we're asking getting at systems are still perpetuating the idea that this is um, an individuating phenomenon or that this is only about individuals and their behavior, um, that their health outcomes are only linked to that. At the clinic setting, it's, it's really being aware of what setting we're working in. So I think about this a lot, again, as a researcher of am I, am I, um, am, am I capturing all of, the, all of the important clinical settings to really understand the phenomenon that I'm trying to understand if it's pregnancy outcomes among people who have substance use disorders and are unstably housed, or if it's chronic non-cancer pain management with people who have co-occurring opioid use disorder, how, what are all the clinical settings that they may interact in? Um, and, and how can I capture that in my research? I mentioned on the community level, it's really who are your allies and who are you working with and collaborating with? In my research context, that means community engaged research, both in its production and dissemination. And at the research level, I'm, I highlighted multi-method research. Um, and I think that's really, uh, we can talk more about this if people have questions in the Q&A, but really there's a lot of different strategies for being able to to get at this. And a lot of my work at UCSF, um, particularly with the Benioff Housing and Homelessness Initiative is to do direct outreach to policymakers and really make sure that they have the, the, uh, the media, uh, the, um, the evidence uh, to be able to inform the larger conversation, both at the policy and the media level, um, so that we're not perpetuating structural stigma um, that really influences care outcomes for people. So I wanna leave time for discussion. So I'll just go over our take home messages and then Michael and I can, can take your questions. Um, our first take home is, you know, structural competency is a framework that addresses the structural factors. And so you wanna stay in structural factors and really, really, really hold on to those institutional relationships, policies and hierarchies that are producing health inequity. Um, applying a structural competency framework um, uh, involves methodological interventions. And I've made this point a couple of times, I really can't say this enough, that there are many strategies for doing structurally competent research, but the, the most important starting point is really understanding your own pos positionality um, and, and what you need to sort of, how you need to educate yourself to be able to do this work effectively. Who do you, who do you need to partner with? And then what are the methodologies, research questions and specific aims? Um, and how are those framed? Are they framed from a, from a structural analysis perspective or are, you know, are they falling short there? And then how do, how do we make sure that we make the structures visible? So I will stop there and get ready for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Knight. And Dr. Harvey, I invite you to invite, unmute yourself and start up your video whenever you're ready. I do see a handful of interesting questions in the Q&A. So I urge our uh, viewers to please write um, additional questions because uh, we're looking forward to tackling as many as we can. Um, I'd like to read a question to you all both from Brittany Beasley. Um, and I suspect that this might be most appropriate for Dr. Knight, but I'm not positive. 
Um, she asks, how do you research and locate policies that contribute structural violence? For example, if someone does a case conceptualization, how would they find policies that could be impacting the client and may represent social determinants of mental health? And if Brittany will forgive me, I wouldn't mind tacking on an additional layer to the question. Um, she's talking about it from the perspective of a clinical provider trying to provide good care. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing how a funding agency such as the NIH or the NIMH might uh, uh, fund research uh, that located policies that contributed to structural violence. If uh, you mind giving a part A and part B to the question, who wants to take this one, Michael or Kelly? I can I can start um, and then and then and then Michael please jump in. Uh, so first I'll answer it as a researcher and then maybe I can answer it some ideas around around NIMH or NIH. As a researcher, one way to start is usually to 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 make sure that your research is following the money. Um, you know, in our healthcare system specifically, and what I mean by that is if you're dealing with a case specifically, to try and understand the ways in which uh, an individual's access to mental health care or other forms of healthcare, other housing and education and employment um, is determined by, um, by their, their level of uh, the resources and the systems that are in place that, 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 uh, that sort that out. So I'll give you a specific example in my book. One of the things that I was really attending to was the way that diagnoses, particularly of bipolar disorder and, and PTSD among the pregnant people I was working with were linked to certain forms of welfare benefit. Um, and so within that system, it created a system of care where a diagnosis of a mental health condition became a really important um, lever to, to uh, create social benefit. And so because the funding was linked, just like the pregnancy, the, the funding for the methadone maintenance in Ms. W's case was linked to her pregnancy status. Anytime you see you know, a mental health condition linked to a funding stream, that's one way to look to see structure. So you can see what are the policies that were created to, to, to limit that um, or to create the categories around it. Who's making those policies? Where did they come from? And do they need to be changed because they're producing a health disparity? Um, or do they need to be interrogated and reevaluated? So that's just one basic tenet of, of, you know, really. And then I do work with policymakers. So I always, I always want the policymakers voice at the table. And so when I do research with key informants, I want to talk to the people because they're often well aware of the structural constraints within, within the work that they do. You know, getting to the question of intention that Michael raised around structural racism, it's not that they, they sometimes they're aware that the, the unintended consequences are coming from the policies and, and uh, programs that they're creating, and sometimes they're not. So really that dialogue is important um, to include them in the research. Don't just include people who have you know, a, um, a mental health condition, but also include all the people who are responsible for their care. From an NIH perspective, um, I think it's really, and I'm seeing more of this, and I'm, I'm really encouraged by it, is, is, you know, RFAs and other forms that are really um, making uh, um, applicants who are, who are writing proposals really articulate the ways in which their research is going to be, to be beneficial to the communities that they're studying or collaborating with, hopefully, um, and not just studying. And also that they're going to have research methodologies that identify um, beyond the individual. And so when that's written into an RFA, when that demand, it's really powerful because, the, of course, as a as a as a, a prospective grantee like myself, I'm paying attention to the NIH priorities and making sure that my proposals, my R01 proposals, match that demand. So, um, so that's just one suggestion that I think they can take a, a more organized. Uh, uh, stance on at the okay. NIH. Michael, do you have uh, anything additional to add? No, I'm, I'll just be sent. I've been answering some questions in the q and I'll just be sensitive to time and uh, uh, just recognize uh, Kelly's uh, expertise on this and there's nothing I can add. I'll take the moderator's pr prerogative, uh, Kelly and Michael, and answer a question of my own. Um, or ask a question of my own, pardon me. Um, what do you see as the role of basic biological science, um, neuroscience, physiology, uh, hormonal levels, and genomic research in understanding how social structures produce health inequity? 
either one of you, whoever wants to take a swing at that one. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll say a word or two and, and then um, like Kelly add. Um, yeah, it's such a great question. Um, and um, I'm, I'm someone who does work in theory. And so I, I immediately think about Nancy, Dr. Nancy Krieger's work in, in social epi at, at Harvard and, and her emphasis on this concept of like embodiment. Uh, and how we kind of embody the social world around us, the kind of social structural world around us. Um, and I think she, she's one of these people who really, I, I feel like tries to bridge this uh, kind of the biological, the genetic, the epigenetic with uh, this kind of structural analysis as well and not treat them as two separate domains, but as thinking of them as kind of part of a continuum. Uh, she even chides a lot of kind of social social theorists for neglecting kind of the, the biological and how how we you know physically incorporate the the um, conditions of our uh, of our lives. So um, that's one one person's work who I feel like is kind of grappling with these questions, which uh, as the question implies, I think um, uh, treats these two domains as as come separate, whereas they 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 oughtn't be. Yeah, and I would just add that this is a really active um, project at UCSF right now through specifically through the repair project, which I mentioned, and I know we wanted to put some resources into the Q&A or into the chat of some links, um, both to the structural comp, the national structural competency work um, web page, which has uh, links also to, to the training, the three, four hour training, which is all open source. So for people who want more information about that, I wanted to mention that. And also uh, to, um, to acknowledge the repair project where we're really thinking actively about the role of the basic science, both in perpetuating um, bad race science, basically, and really using, using race as a category inappropriately um, in, uh, you know, in clinical and community epi, as well as grappling with sort of where do we where do we have a structurally competent or an anti-racist research platform that can incorporate productively the basic science? So on the repair project on our steering committee, we intentionally have people who are social scientists and basic scientists really trying to think through. It's a huge question and a really critical one. Um, and I would love to see um, you know, um, some actual, some, some research on actually how to, how to do that and how to move that conversation forward because it's an active, uh, active question for us in, in medical education at UCSF. Fascinating. Um, it just seems like we never have enough time for questions. Um, I'd like to mention to it, perhaps it's the Naya Galvin or perhaps it's the Nia Galvin um, that the links that uh, Michael Harvey just posted in the link will um, help you figure out how to get a hold of that um, fuller, more complete training that was mentioned earlier. And um, I hope uh, that um, others of you uh, found the questions that were answered in the Q&A to be uh, as interesting as I did. Um, the upcoming webinars in this Syria, uh, series, uh, uh, we have uh, the National Institute of Mental Health James Jackson Memorial Award uh, speaker, which is to be determined, but uh, will be on July 27th. We have advancing methods and measures to examine the underlying mechanisms of violent death for LGBTQ populations. And we have the Research Workforce Diversity Program. Both of those are scheduled for September. And you can register at the theme website where you register to hear this webinar. I'm grateful to all for attending and for the excellent questions that were posed. I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Kelly Knight and Dr. Michael Harvey for a uh, fascinating, substantive and thoughtful presentation. Uh, for programmatic questions and information about webinar recordings, feel free to uh, write us at the web, at the uh, email address listed on the slide. And thank you.